Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri appellate attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. One of the things that I was always careful about when I brought a case is I was really careful about my opening statement. When you do an opening statement, whether you represent the state or whether you represent a private plaintiff, you have to be careful about getting over your skis. You don't want to tell the jury that you're going to bring them evidence that doesn't wind up coming in. By the same token, anytime you're defending a claim, you want to make sure that you talk about what the evidence is not, but there is a fine line between telling people what evidence won't be in a case and arguing to the jury. It is opening statement, it is not opening argument, and you're not supposed to argue during opening statement. Opening statement is all about previewing the case for the jury. It's okay to tell them what's going to happen. It's not okay to tell them how to feel about it. We're going to take a look today at the defense opening statement in the Bryce Rhodes case. In case you're unfamiliar with that case, basically what happened there is Bryce Rhodes is alleged to have murdered two young boys who saw him commit a different murder. This case is eight years old. It's venued in Kentucky. It was investigated by the Louisville Metropolitan Police Department. And there are some issues in the case, as you'll see when we go through certain parts of this opening statement. But when a, when a, when a defense attorney makes an opening statement, generally speaking, you, li you give them a little bit of leeway, but you don't let them, you know, it, you can't let them run away with it and just start arguing. And in this particular case, that's exactly what the prosecution does. Let's take a look at a couple of uh, segments of that right now. But I'm here to make sure that nobody is wrongfully convicted, and that's why you are here. And indeed, that is her job. As jurors in this case, you guys have a great responsibility. But with that responsibility also comes a great power. You all have the power to hold the government to their burden of proving Bryce Rhodes guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You have the power to say no. You, you have are. the power to say we are not convinced. Or you are and the power to know that that decision is okay. Only if the evidence isn't so there. So how do you make that decision? As Ms. Jones-Brown told you earlier, none of us can define reasonable doubt for you. That's up to you as a juror. That's up to you as an individual. Actually, there is a definition. So what are you gonna to use to make this determination? You will hear evidence over the next several days you will decide what evidence you find credible, what witnesses you find believable. So what evidence do you all expect to see to help you make this decision? It's a very important decision. Eyewitnesses, that might be good. I think you'll find that there aren't any eyewitnesses <coughs> who were not themselves involved in these crimes. Okay, now that's completely Correct. He, she absolutely has the right to do exactly what she just did there, which is to say, hey, there's nobody here who didn't have a part in this, although that's not quite the whole story. And I realized as I started listening to this young lady that I needed to give a little background in that uh, one of the problems that this particular case has had is that the defendant here is Daryl Brooks version 2.0. He has done things like spit on his attorneys. He has threatened judges by telling them that he's going to find out where she lives and come visit her. Not the judge that's currently hearing this case, but a prior judge. Um, he is currently sitting in the courtroom under penalty of if he gets out of line, they're going to put him in a stun vest, which means when he starts raising cane, they'll push a button and all of a sudden he'll do the spastic chicken on the floor. So they, this is a, a really 
odd case in a number of ways. They, uh, they had originally sought the death penalty, but a soft-hearted, uh, maybe even soft-headed judge decided that uh, because the guy is so whacked out, maybe that it isn't fair to impose the death penalty. Uh, I think it would be completely fair based on the fact that he m- allegedly murdered two boys, and, and we're talking children here. But in terms of setting up the situation here, it's perfectly okay to talk about what evidence isn't there. Where she steps out of line is when she starts telling people how to feel about the evidence that's being presented. Let's take a listen to some of that. I want to give you an alternate perspective, if you will, than what the government does. Have they accused the right person? Or was Bryce an easy target to blame? Has the one who already committed these crimes pled guilty? I ask you all to listen to the evidence, observe the witnesses, and ask yourselves if something isn't quite right here. Now that's going a little bit too far. You know, I think that treads into argument. I think you should tell them to evaluate the evidence. And and that's what she did. But she's stepping on some toes here when she says that something's not quite right. Because it implies that there is, you know, wrongdoing on someone's part. And I don't think she has any evidence of that. Evidence will show that there is a reasonable doubt that Bryce Rhodes is guilty. Let's talk about the detectives in this case. As you all know, the local Metro Police Department um, was the agency responsible for investigating both of these uh, murders, both both scenes, or or, excuse me, both incidents on May 4th and then again on May 22nd. And there were two lead detectives, as the Commonwealth told you, Detective Griffin and Detective Tonelli, and you'll hear from both of them. But I want you to think about how many hands were involved in this case. When it comes to to handling evidence, interviewing witnesses, executing search warrants. Okay, again, it's okay to make comments about the evidence that's not there, but now she's going outside the evidence. She's telling them to look at something that isn't there. And that would be proper on closing argument because it's argument, but it's not proper here. And the prosecution should really be objecting at this point. Mistakes were made. And I want you to think, can we rely on every person that works for the local Metro Police Department? Argument. You will learn that the Metro... Louisville Metro Police Department investigated these homicides. And once again, this is the same force that murdered Breonna Taylor. Okay, now she has gone a bridge too far, and the prosecution is objecting here. Breonna Taylor, for those of you who don't remember, she was a young black woman who was killed because police officers, in returning fire against somebody who they were trying to execute a warrant and essentially everything went wrong. Uh, the police officers have been charged. One of them has pleaded guilty, but the other the other one had a hung jury. So there's not exactly what I would call a consensus in the community that there was a murder here. Um, the Many of you will probably remember the facts of that case, and, and it's okay to have different opinions on that, but no police department has ever been convicted of the murder. Now, the officers have pleaded guilty to violating her civil rights, but not murder. Murder is an intentional crime. An intentional crime, in this case, would be they had the intent to go in there and murder her. And clearly, they did not do that. They were working on a drug issue, from what I understand. So, when she makes this statement and says what she says... It creates the illusion that somehow these two uh, cases, Bryce Rhodes' case and Brianna Taylor's case, are somehow linked. And, well, let's just listen to what the judge has to say about that. So they have the white noise turned on, 
and now we'll get to hear what the judge has to say about that. That nasty noise of the white noise will quit here in just a second. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point in the case, there has not been any evidence presented that links any information in this case to the case of Breonna Taylor. I'm going to admonish you to disregard counsel's last statement at this point. And I would suggest that uh, this young lady is um, going to be subject to being sanctioned if she goes that way again on, you know, makes that claim again in this case, because there just is no evidence to that effect. And the other issue is that because Bryce Rhodes is, is an African-American and Breonna Taylor was an African-American woman, um, there's a linkage here that tends to imply racism, and attorneys are not supposed to do that. They are not supposed to make that implication without evidence, and there is no evidence that the cases are linked or that racism was involved in either of those two. So <clears throat> let's go on to see what happens when, after the uh, rebuke by the judge. Ladies and gentlemen, even if you find... Detective Tanelli and Detective Bourbon, the two lead detectives in this case. As I mentioned, there were so many hands in this case. Can you rely on everyone else that works for Louisville Metro Police Department? Now she's about to make some good points here. Lied under oath about one of the biggest pieces of physical evidence that the police possessed. He told the court under oath not once, but twice that law enforcement had a piece of evidence that they did not have and do not have. So you might be asking yourself, I can, I can see how some evidence could be lost. Maybe it was a tiny piece of hair. Maybe it was a speck of DNA. That's reasonable. Ladies and gentlemen, no, it was an entire back seat of a car. It's gone. You know how I told you earlier that, that Bryce's the police stated that Bryce's back seat had been removed. Detective Tonelli told a judge and then a grand jury that the Louisville Metro Police Department had found and collected a burnt back seat from a dumpster that matched Bryce Rhodes's back seat. And now it's gone. I am mystified as to how you lose a piece of evidence that big. And again, this is argument. The prosecutor should be jumping up and objecting because she's arguing. She is now it's okay to say they lost the evidence, but now she's trying to tell the jury how to feel about it. And that is a violation. She absolutely should be drawing an objection here, and why she isn't drawing an objection is beyond me. But I have to admit that is pretty amazing. Not only physically, but, but to the case as well. If it was burned, it wouldn't be that huge. So in an effort to get Bryce charged, the court was misled, the grand jury was misled about a piece of evidence in the LMPD's possession. It wouldn't have been misled, however, if they actually did collect the evidence and then they lost it. Um, the fact that it was burned probably makes it less useful than it would otherwise be. But she does make a good point here about that. Did they lie under oath about having it? Or did they dispose of it? Because it didn't help their case. That's a good point. But again, that's argument. And that's not appropriate on opening. The Louisville Metro Police Department searched the home of Bryce's mother where he was residing on Hyde Avenue in Louisville two times. The first search, officers found nothing incriminating. They even commented on how clean the apartment was. The crime scene unit was there, detectives were there, officers were there. It was now you have to remember here that there were two murders. There was a murder of a man of a man by the name of Jones, I believe it was, that occurred uh, early in May of that year. And then a couple of weeks later, there were two boys who were murdered because they were witnesses to the first murder. So it is entirely reasonable for the police to search the property 
twice. Now, she's making this, what I would call, argument, and unfortunately for her, I think that's going to be very easily explained by the police officers. They couldn't have been searching for the murder information, uh, for the murder of the boys, in the early part when they were just trying to nail down who killed uh, Mr. Jones. So again, a lot of uh, there there is a fine line between making an opening statement and making an opening argument. Many times a lawyer will not object, uh, basically to preserve uh, an opportunity for the other lawyer to you know, so so you're not interrupting their flow, and and that is laudable. And if they think they have good answers for all of these issues that are being raised by this defense counsel, then they're going to let her go ahead and step right into the trap of making these outrageous claims on opening and then knocking them down as they present their direct uh, examinations of these witnesses. It will be interesting to follow that in this case and see where the police testimony goes see how they explain what happened with the back seat of the car. As far as evidence going missing, it happens all the time in every police department in the country, and that doesn't necessarily mean there's anything nefarious about that, although certainly it could be. And, you know, I, I don't know what the Louisville Metropolitan Police Department is like in terms of uh, its evidence handling methodologies, but certainly losing a back seat to a car is a pretty huge amount of evidence to lose. Just because I would have objected doesn't mean that the prosecutors here were wrong for not objecting. Like I said, they may have a strategic uh, idea behind that. But as a general rule, it is never a good idea to get into argument during opening because it makes you look weak. It makes you look weak because you're essentially whining about stuff the jury hasn't even seen yet and doesn't know anything about. And of course, pretrial stuff, things that happen with the grand jury, that sort of thing, all of those can be directed on appeal. That's what I have for you today. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. And of course, if you want to, you can always email me at the address above. If you have the opportunity today, please go out of your way. Do something nice for somebody. Open a door. Um, let somebody use your cell phone to make a phone call that they need to make. Whatever you can do to make somebody else's life a little better, please do it. It will make your day better. It will make their day better. And kindness is never repaid. It's only passed on somewhere down the line. That person is going to pass on a kindness. And with that approach, we can all do a little something to change the world we live in. Thank you for watching. Catch me down here at the beach tomorrow. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.